Salutations, my friends, and welcome back to TNO and for playing in Africa. Really, America. But right now in Africa, because we love Africa, especially the Union of South Africa last time. What do we do? We got Mr. Robert Francis, I think it's Francis, uh, Kennedy. Yeah, Robert Francis Kennedy. And, uh, yeah, we had a pretty good time, and unfortunately his brother, well, he, he doesn't, he passed away. Not very cool, but regardless, we've got to continue moving on and uh, honor his legacy. We'll call it like that. Honor his legacy by screwing up a lot of things. But we can't really screw things up until the 1966 midterms are here. Take these guys out so they can't link back up. As we're going to be destroying these African Reichskommissariats. God dang, they move so fast. I love it. God. Uh, we have like, actually quite a few comments to get through. So, uh, let's see. Someone says, do not create one giant African state. You can actually... If you didn't know, like once this war is over, you can completely create like all, out of almost all this territory one massive African state, which sounds amazing. Uh, it's not good to do, but you can, because you actually get a lot of debuffs if you do that. So it's probably not in the best interests of, in our interests actually, to do that for this campaign, just because. Well, where we're headed, we gonna need a lot of support. So, uh, let's see. So yeah. As much as I'd love to, we're not going to do that. Let's see where it's capital. We're going to get all the way down there. Cool. And where are you at right now? You're moving on up. Uh, actually, you hold. Oh, they're dead. Whatever. Just go ahead on down here, Salisbury. Cool. And other comments. Yes. Someone said, Heli divisions or helicopter divisions are the true quick response forces. They are. They are, my god, so fast. Look how fast they're going through Africa. Oh, did we win? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, we did. Triumph in South Africa. It is official. Africa's free. The Organization of Free Nations has emerged victorious in the fight against the Africa Shield, crushing the three Reichskommissariats that tried to tear a democratic South Africa apart and expand their fascist ideology all over Africa. President RFK spoke to the nation from the Oval Office and announced the victory, and that America's brave boys will be returning home as soon as humanly possible. You know, this is awesome, seeing as he's literally, like, within a month or two of his, uh, you know, his presidency he's already won in africa even as the first chartered pan am flights touched down at airports across the eastern seaboard crowds of thousands filled terminals and parking lots waving flags singing the national anthem and cheering heartwarming scenes of tired soldiers hugging and kissing their young wives and children snapped by photographers to be shared in newspapers and preserved for eternity the secretary of defense has announced the plans to hold a military parade in washington dc to honor the return veterans that saved a continent from barbarity and slavery with this with the defeat of the nazis in africa now comes a long and tough work to rebuild half a continent for a bright and democratic future war crime trials will be held to try to capture the SS and Wehrmacht soldiers, as well as the Boer irregulars that caused so much death and destruction. New nations will be set up to allow the people of Africa to make their own destiny, and fully support it and rebuilt by American money and technical expertise. And of course, millions of people, former slaves, war amputees, orphans, the hungry and sick, will have to be cared for in Africa, as well as our own troops who will have seen bloody battles and gruesome deeds that will believe that few believe humans are capable of. But that is tomorrow's job. Today we celebrate uh, the victory over the Nazis, and that our brave men and women are coming home. Stability, war support, political power, the OFN grows a little bit more united, discontent with the world will fall by a lot. Unlock more national focuses, get more social democracy, and get less conservative democracy. The dark continent, no more. Look at that. The Provisional Government of the Congo. Oh, they're by Crichton Abrams Jr. Okay. And I don't think they have a focus tree. No, they don't. And we have the one for the Congo. Or Angola. This is Angola. Level. Hey! Aren't you my... You're my general that I use for, uh... uh the Special for Air Force. Teams of Africa, do you have anything to note? And then we have the... Unity government here. Led by that dude. Cool. Now, unfortunately, the domestic situation we could pull out of Africa. Uh, so that was actually another comment. Pull out of Africa immediately because if we can get bogged down in Africa, this could become basically like our, to a degree, kind of Iraq of like the early 2000s. Like, we could send so much money, so much supplies to build them up, but it's going to cost us so much, like in terms of finances and political support, that uh, <clears throat> if we stay here, it could really, really hurt us. Like, it's not very good if we stay there. And actually, let's see. American society is disunited. Well, it won't be for forever. So, the South African War victory. When we took the brave decision to join in South Africa's defensive war against the German aggressors, there were many who claimed that we had entered a pointless war, one where true victory was impossible due to the circumstances of the situation. Yet, when the final Rex Commissariat surrendered and the readers were taken into custody, no one could deny the fact that we had achieved overwhelming victory against the forces of tyranny. During the war, we discovered the deplorable conditions the natives peoples of Africa were kept in by the German oppressors. Disease and famine were common, and the regimes cared little for the people beyond how much wealth they could be extracted before they ran dry. This had to be changed. Our South African allies have taken administrative control over Namibia, Rhodesia, and southern Mozambique. That leaves the vast swaths of 
land in Central Africa under our control, keeping the lands would be a ridiculous and idiotic idea. However, we must choose whether to establish multiple democratic states in the area, or whether to attempt to create a single unified Central African state. I would love to create one united single African state, because I've actually done that off screen. It's a lot of fun. It's great. But... Let's... Maybe, perhaps we should try to do the sensible thing here. Alright, so, current investment in Africa is low. And actually, see... Because you get a focus here. We still have Jim Crow. Oh, crap. Um, uh, around here, increase our investment in Africa by a small amount. Increase our investment as... Ooh, this will help mandates fight rebels somewhat. Yeah. Divided, it's much easier for them to fight off rebels and stuff. But, I'll be honest. My, this campaign... I'm not worried about Africa. I just wanted to kill the Nazis. <laughs> That's all I wanted to do. I just kill the Nazis off. Uh, but really, my ultimate goal is to get someone, a certain someone elected in 68. That was my main campaign goal. So I'm sorry if you wanted me to play as RFK for realsies. But I'm not going to in this campaign. I will come back and play as RFK, you know, Robert Francis Kennedy, again sometime. Uh, but that this is not the campaign for it because I want a certain Buckeye to lead the country. But I'm, I'm going to give Africans freedom, okay? We love, in America, freedom. So, I'm going to give them freedom, and I'm going to pull out immediately, because I don't want any sort of bad effects to happen from this. I don't want to get bogged down in Africa. We beat the Nazis, let them kill each other. Cool. And we have the... Oh, I thought we were doing the Kennedy presidency anyways. Oh, and we can do fighting tyranny since 1776. We have the options to do health care with charity for all, as well as with malice towards none. But let's go back and do this. I think I read this yesterday. Hey, I'm joining with my cat, Pinky. Yeah, you want my chair, Pinky? There you go. So, election day is coming past, and RFK is now 36 president of the U.S. I think I read this last time. If you want to read this, go right ahead. So, cool. If Jack never quit, even in his final seconds, then neither will Bobby. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get bothered in Africa. We won the war. That's all I care about. We showed up. <laughs> we killed people. And <laughs> we left. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Let's see. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and six and a half, really. The mandate expires. Following their successful intervention in the South African War, the OFN found themselves occupying large swaths of the continent. There were great hopes for the mandate set up to administer the territory. They would empower the natives and prove the superiority of democratic governance. Sound, tested models of, of administration and investment would unlock the economic potential of Africa. The Indian and South Atlantic Oceans would be secured for the free world. Like many foreign conquerors before them, they soon found their ambitions dashed. Their leadership found itself overwhelmed, trying to make sense of the disparate, disparate tribes, factions, and groupings, and struggled to make just... To maintain the status quo. Investments dried up as delays, red tape, and petty corporation corruption made a mockery of investment models and profit projections. Generals and politicians alike watched with horror as patrol after patrol failed to make it back to their bases. The cumulative weight of all these setbacks had proven too much to bear for the mandates and their masters, and now they're cutting back their losses and leaving the territories. What now for Africa? Oh, they're, they're, they're just going to explode in several different states, that's all. I mean, actually, do, actually, this is a lot better than trying to make everything to one central African state. Because if you see, like, if you saw, like, me playing this off screen, if you make one giant state, they have nothing but rebels everywhere. Like, oh, they almost have, like, no core territory. But with this, they actually do have some core territory. Maybe I should have stayed. Oh, well. <laughs> Lackluster infrastructure. I wonder if that would get, like, a focus tree for these guys, too. East African warlordism. Salazar wants colonies returned. Uh, let's see. Following our victorious conclusion of the South African War, one cannot neglect to mention the support of Iberia within the conflict. Their sizable contribution significantly aided in creating the conditions for victory over the Boers in the German sphere. Not really. The Iberians themselves are really well aware, aware of this fact and thus are attempting to leverage it to their best advantage. Recently, a signed letter from Caldillo Salazar, the Portuguese co-dictator of Iberia, sent or arrived for the president. The nature of the letter, if one could get around the complexities of diplomatic writing, was a candid request. Salazar expressed to us that. Following the significant Iberian contributions in South Africa, Iberia formally requests from the United States that Iberia be allowed to reoccupy her former Portuguese colonies seized by the Germans in prior decades. Whilst we understand the Iberian desire to reclaim her former territories following a hard-fought conflict, it would be near impossible to retain a positive moral image should we accept. Our public image is one for fighting for freedom and against German imperialism and aggression in the region. Should we allow Iberia her spoils of war, it would merely appear as replacing one colonial, colonial dictatorship with another. The Iberians will not be pleased to be denied, however, for our own sake, we have no, we have what, but we have but one, but one choice. We appreciate the help, but that's not so acceptable. That'd be cool if we actually did get the option of doing that. I think that'd be really cool. Oh, a little bit of lag. Are they exploding? Yay! The Republic of Angola. Hello. Hey, hello. Oh, you're still my puppet. For now. Well, we'll see what happens. And they're probably... Oh, boy. Yeah, Zambia. Gaza land. Yeah, they're not under us. Cool. But 
Angola is still here. The boys are coming home. As he addressed from the White House and so too does the first major conflict between the U.S. and a major power for the first time in nearly two decades. The housewife of a military man, having heard that her husband will indeed be coming home, screeches in delight. As her neighbor, having only received her flag for her deceased the day before, oh crap, stares at the TV in her broken t torpor. Oof. College students put aside their protest placards and megaphones for the day, choosing instead the bottle and blunt for the day, basking in the fruit of their success, or the unstated delight that they will not be called up anytime soon. The draftees in boot camp continue to curse their fate and their drill sergeants, but a tad quieter relieved that their service might be a peaceful one. In the Pentagon, planners quickly vacate their desks for a longer than usual smoke break. Their immediate work mercifully concluded. Concluded, that is, until an inevitable orders come to prepare for the soldiers' return. And in the White House, the President receives another briefing their thoughts unknowable beneath a facade of practice calm. Across America, the nation welcomes the first day after the South African War tomorrow. America will grieve the dead and embrace its returning heroes and start coming to terms with the horrors of the war in the veldt and its consequences. Another generation defined by war. Are we really so happy in our faction? Dude, that's awesome. I didn't... I, I expected... Oh, that's a big old Congolese re led by... Oh. That's a big old Congolese Republic. That's kind of cool. I can't believe we actually have Angola under us. Oh, that's because this guy... Remember from the last episode we had an, an event saying that some guy from Angola showed up? And he wanted us kind of to help him out. I totally remember that now. Legacy of an Air Empire. Cool. I, I don't mind helping them out if I can. I mean, since they're part of the OFN, great. The Kennedy presidency. Uh, let's figure it all out. So, my fellow Americans, I will be frank, the past four years have wrecked a terrible toll upon the U.S. and our institutions. Fear for the future runs rapid, yet to stretch for the oath sworn to lead this nation through it grows with each scandal. But must we give in to our lesser natures and believe that nothing can right America's path before the point of no return? I think not. America and her people are no strangers to crisis. The darkest of times where the character and strength shine brightest, and Americans have showcased great fortitude and unity in every war and depression that has assailed us for 200 years. We've been de dealt bloody many times in the past, but we eventually recovered. And from each, we've emerged stronger than before. My fellow Americans, I ask one thing from you, and one thing only to believe. Believe in the fortitude that resides in your hearts. Believe in the goodwill that, that guides our thoughts and actions. Believe that this great country will survive the present crisis, or the present crisis, just as it has survived worse in the past. Believe that the present will pass, and together we will find our ways back towards a future every American, no matter their race, class, or creed, can look forward to stability and more social democracy. Cool. And we're getting a lot of political power now, which is nice. New president, new America. RFK had spent years devoted to his work, allowing himself new f a few pleasures. So he thought it was only fair that after being inaugurated president of the United States, he allowed himself a knife of overindulgence with a bottle of Malbec and his beautiful wife. Unfortunately, the pleasures of yesterday's pale in the light of dawn. Hungover, stomach arching, the new president plastered a smile onto his face as he mounted the podium in the White House press to give his first speech to the nation. My fellow Americans, it is with great pride that I come before you today as your president. To put, have you put your trust in me as you did my father, my brother before me does a great honor. Why did I change my accent? He stifled a sudden burst of melancholy as the thought of Jack, forcing himself to carry on. Now that I am your president, I may finally address the issues of our nation faces, which, which our nation faces today. Rapid inequality, political instability, growing isolationism on the world stage. It is no secret that we live in turbulent times. He took a breath, but together we can move past them. I believe in an America with rights for all of our people, regardless of the race, an America purge of injustices and inequality that ought to have remained in the previous century, an America taking her rightful place as a force for global good. This is my dream, I would like to make it your dream as well. I hereby pledge the country I love so dear that I will reform this great nation of ours together as Americans we may face anything. And so on. I seem to have a strong impact on the press, thought Kennedy as he left the podium. The only kid hope that after Nixon's duplicity, the people were ready to believe in the president again to believe in a better tomorrow. Our light shall burn, the pathway to the stars. Cool. We have 43 Republican Democrat Senators, and then we have 55 NPP people. Cool. And actually, American society is disunited, which should honestly be a little bit more united since we won the war, but whatever. Uh, the parties are working fairly okay-ish. Uh, we can help out here. we got to save up political power, because even though we're getting 0.8 a day, not bad, not great. We could get England on our side, but we have minus 2 influence every month. They have 20% more influence. And like I said before, I don't really care about England in this campaign too much. So we're having a good time. Pay off some more of the debt. Thank you. Oh, and Russia is... Oh, but Commando Baltistat. Holy crap. Central European Council looks pretty cool. Uh, Samada's doing well, pretty well figuring it all out, though. And another foot. One foot in front of the other. With Kennedy elected, we now need to undertake a task that will decide the direction of the administration goes towards for the next four years. With Kennedy having to appease both the party and the voters, he walks a tight line of putting those he finds honorable and, that, and those he finds just as another career politician who jumped on the National Progressive Party bandwagon. With multiple candidates vying for the top spot and only a few spots to go around, Kennedy must choose carefully. Oh boy, Return of the King. Oh no, no, no. Hey, Dovanga. Is he still alive? Oh, Oscar. Oh, Oscar. Ah, <sighs> what a guy. Hmm. <laughs> wow. Ergutsk, are you having a bit of a scaff or a bit of a tussle with Amur and the Divine Mandate? You're not even connected here, are you? No, they're not. Oh, that's sad. Ah, one foot in front of the other. 
and now our moral shadow. The United States of America is perhaps the greatest nation in, in modern history. Its footprint spans from the far shores of Australia to the icy mountains of I Iceland. With the only challenges being the barbarous Japanese and the failing Germans, there's no doubt freedom will span the rest of the world in t no time. Our fair nation faces a paradox, however. We, while we project Uncle Sam on every continent, Uncle Sam himself is sickly and weak. His fingers ache with arthritis and his stomach grumbles with the hunger of a nation subsidized at subsiding on little but what he can beg for. As we throw our army and money and navy off to foreign lands to fight foreign foes, we let our own people starve and grovel for scrapes. Or scraps. No matter how much it costs through the very bones and blood of our nation, we must close this great ga gaping fault in our great country. Not just for America, but for the world. A born in the USA, it seemed as soon as a boat docked at the Norfolk, Virginia port, that Jonathan Stafford, soldier of the 134th Jayhawk, Plains Division, would finally find peace after years of turmoil in the South African War. He was born to a poor farming couple in the central Kansas and learned to drive a tractor when he was only seven years old. His skill came with a rifle when he crossed the border into Arkansas and began hunting wild hogs to feed his mother and father. When he turned 18, he was faced with a dilemma. Either join the army and provide parents a substantial income, or stay on the farm for eternity. Once the recruiters arrived at the farm, Jonathan's parents would not see their son again for another six years. Training came and went, and before he knew it, Jonathan's division was sent off to Port Elizabeth. The Jayhawk Division, organized in Kansas, was well prepared for the lowly plains of South Africa, but mastering the train was only one step in the process of combat. Stafford himself was involved in several offenses against Germans and pulled together several kills, but his involvement ended when he was shot in the shoulder. While he was being taken to cover, an advancing German shot another two bullets into his wrist and hand. The wounds were not fatal, and Stafford fully recovered, but much to his chagrin, he was sent back home. Now Stafford was a very proud American, and he hoped that the general public would hail him as a hero who fought for his country. To put it bluntly, he received the exact opposite. Protesters spat on him, threw dirt in his face, even tried to frame him for murder. Students from Kansas State found his address and attempted to set his parents' farm ablaze. Jesus Christ! But police arrested them before they could do before they could act. The public response to Stafford's ac actions was possibly even more scarring than his experiences in the war. He only did what he was oh he was only he only did what he was told. I'm, okay, come on, uh, that's a bit ex that's ex that's pretty god darn extreme. But Jesus Christ! Oof. I mean, we, we, we even won. This isn't the Vietnam where we, we pulled out early. We won the war. We killed off all of Central to Southern Africa. We did really, really well. So, come on, man. Return of the King, though. It's a common misconception that the Secretary of Defense be a former military man, a hard-ass jug head who could yell like a drill sergeant and fight like a sailor on shore leave. That type of man is ill-suited to stand against the monstrous bureaucracy that is a military-industrial complex. What the job truly calls for is a wily man, a clever man, a veteran of red tape. Claude Pepper is that man. Rising from the abysmal Floridian local government to the Senate, Pepper made a name for himself as a hardline progressive and a staunch enemy of communism and fascism, quickly becoming accustomed to the Byzantine politics of the National Progressive Party. Pepper was able to wrangle his selection as running mate during Strom Thurnburn Thurman's failed presidential campaign back in 60. Ever survivor of the churning seas of politics, Pepper cemented himself as an ally of Kennedy's from, a, from the get-go. The closeness of other ideological stand, standpoints made him a hell of a lot more palatable to Pepper than Thurman had ever been. A dinosaur of the party, Pepper's long decades cultivating alliances and pulling strings will come in useful or use with him in the cabinet, as well as the legitimacy he gives the young president, thanks to his history as one of the Congress's longest-serving progressives. If first you don't succeed, try and try again. School of mass combat, huh? The civilizing influence of women. Oh boy. What are those? Women? What? Hmm, not bad. 300 factories? Not enough. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Wait, 1, 2, 3. Oh, wait. Do we boost the civilian budget yet? There we go. There we go. So the civilizing influence of women. Today, history has made its former Sen Senator Maureen Newberg becomes, becomes the first woman to be appointed to the cabinet of the U.S. The president's new secretary of the treasury, Newberg, resigned her Senate seat in order to take up her new position. A veteran of Oregon state politics... Along with her late husband, Richard, Maureen was elected to the Senate in the 50s, her husband shortly following her to become the Senate's first husband and wife legislative team. Newberger continued to serve following Richard's death from cancer in 1960. Immensely popular in Oregon, Newberger has made a name for herself as a staunch progressive, particularly on social issues such as civil rights and health care. Although some question the decisions of appointing a politician known for her focus on social issues to a largely economic position, the president picked her for that exact reason, to ensure that his administration would not prioritize profit over people. Nevertheless, it's a sad reality that a woman can't get far in federal politics without being as shrewd as a fox. Well, that's probably that's probably just anyone. You gotta be shrewd. But behind Newberger's soft voice and warm smile lies a clever political operator well experienced in the glad handing of Washington, making her a strong asset to the inexperienced president. If you want something done in politics, ask a woman. Uh, well, okay then. Uh, expenditures, that's a lot of expenditures. But revenue's not bad. 
There's been a lot of events so far, and we've got to still get to a couple more combats. So, someone recommends don't get RFK assassinated. Well, we'll see about that. Last but not least, filling out President Kennedy's new cabinet is Henry Mucci, newly appointed Secretary of State, a native of Connecticut, and like the President, a Roman Catholic. Mucci is the first Italian-American ever appointed to the cabinet, a move incredibly popular among Catholics and urban Italian immigrants and their descendants. After surviving the attack on Pearl Harbor, Mucci distinguished himself as a colonel of the Army Rangers, particularly in the heroic rescue of 513 survivors of the Bataan Death March from the prison in, Phil in the Philippines. Returning to Connecticut as a national hero, Mucci rode the wave of his newfound fame to Congress, beginning his career as a moderate progressive, quickly becoming fast friends with Kennedy after his nomination. Mucci nevertheless remains a neutral and stabilizing force in the cabinet, assuaging the fears of those who had been anxious the president would pack his bench with hardline reformers. As Secretary of State, Mucci can be expected to be a man of split personality, a love of the glove domestically, and an iron fist of rod. One thing is for sure, after seeing firsthand the brutality that, comes, that fascists are capable of in the horrific squalor of the Cabanatuan prison camp, Mucci won't go easy on the enemies of freedom. Cool. Spe speak softly and carry a big stick. Oh wow, look at that. Organization for air assault and like special forces tw plus 20%. And they get 50% more attack and defense. Jesus Christ, I love Mucci. A battle of Barcelona. Oh look, nice rifle. Iberia's test has come. Oh, we'll see what happens. Oh look, Lavelle, you're back. I guess you got fired from your job in Angola. Happens, you know. I still can't get over that we got Angola with us. That's so nice. Oh, there goes Slovak State though. Bye bye, Slovak State. Oh, you're back. Oh man, mock. You're not looking too happy. Look like you're tired, man. Take a nap. And uh, Borman won, right? I'm pretty sure Borman won the Civil War. Yep, Mr. Balding. Smoke him out. Loyalistin. Cool. Uh, so yeah. Ooh, a more show. So basically, the comment says, don't get him assassinated. Do not get Robert Francis Kennedy assassinated yet. Or eventually. Um, you can go too liberal. If you go, if you push as hard as you can for liberalism, or being more progressive, you, you will get assassinated. So we can't do this. And we just can't do that. So the party above all. Political pundits lampoon the NPP voter as a schizophrenic, mercurial, erratic, quick to shift opinion in between gulps of breath. A disingenuous portrayal of the party at large, of course, but to brush off brush their words off without a second thought is to ignore the problems that have plagued the NPP since its inception. Contradictions over platform and policy are inherent in any big tent party, with presidential ambitions. Benefiting its unprecedented scale, the NPP runs a whole gamut of America's broad political spectrum. Conversely, establishing party-wide consensus and a united front against the Republican-Democrat opposition will be difficult due to the wide variety of ideologies it tolerates. Only hatred of both the rising sun and the old establishment binds the party together, and in any other scenario, it would not have existed. President Kennedy has decided to prioritize forming the consensus his party it and his agenda desperately needs. Getting Wallace and Chavez to sit at the table will be an ex exercise in herding cats. But by hook or crook, the NPP will stand together, lose together, and win together for his term and beyond. It'll be seen as a less liberal. Not necessarily more conservative, but as less liberal. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ish. They're over there. Striking a match. Henry Mucci, Secretary of State. Lit his and his president's cigars. Cubans, Mr. President. Gifts from Fidel himself. Best in the world, the absolute best. Indeed, replied Kennedy, smiling blithely. There certainly are perks to have friends overseas. I wish only we could get to the Belgian chocolate. The two men puffed away in comfortable silence, filling the Oval Office with slowly drifting waves of blue smoke. With the air of a man dredged up a thought of the deepest silt of his mind, Kennedy said, You know, Henry, we're going to have to make some changes. After all that turmoil in African Guiana, the voters want us to show our teeth when the fascists come knocking. That... That's the way that washed the Republican Democrats right out of the White House. If we don't show a firm hand with the jabs, it'll wash us right back out to the sea in 68. Exulting in a thin stream of smoke, Mucci tapped his cigar into the ashtray, smiling at the president with, ni with nicotine-stained teeth, he said. Damn straight, Bobby. We're going to give Hirohito the spanking of his daddy ought to give him. Wow, that's is weird. Let me say that again. We're going to give Hirohito the spanking his daddy ought to give him. Wow, I am weird. Kennedy was still unable to prevent his mouth curving in amusement. That will, Henry. That we will. Time to rattle some sabers. Cool. V Vitusio wins in Oslo. Oh, who's that? Wait, hold on. I don't think I've ever seen Mikhail Vituska. Vituska. I don't think I've ever seen that. Austin is his? I've never seen that. Holy cow. Well, yeah, usually it's some really, really super, even hard, more hardcore, like, national socialist win in Austin, but okay, cool. A supermarket in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. 2.04 a.m. Joe Smith found a little enjoyment in his menial night job stocking shelves at the Carnes Quality Foods, but if he wanted to be the first in his family to attend college, he'd need more than a few bucks to his name. Putting every penny in the bank, he scrimped and he saved, spending weekends watching the tube instead of taking chicks to the movies with his buddies. Who actually does that still? The only thing keeping him going, sleepless night after sleepless night, were his dreams of someday throwing his academic cap in the air, shelving cereal boxes on autopilot. Joe found himself remembering the new news report he got on CBS the previous weekend. Apparently, President Kennedy had given a speech on the importance of education especially for America's youth, and expressed support for working-class people going to college. 
Joe had been surprised to hear that, after years of his parents telling him that politicians didn't care about people like him. Maybe the president was trying to garner some votes, but his intention really did matter so as long as he kept his word, right? Finishing the cereal, Joe got to work on the coffee and tea. Was it possible that the president really cared about people like him? Joe had been too young to vote in 64, but even if he had been old enough, he... His family's lack of faith in the establishment, formed after generations of alienation and disenfranchisement, would likely have kept him from the polling booth. Nevertheless, he heard a lot about the President Kennedy with his policies on TV, and found himself agreeing with a lot more of it. He hoped that he didn't make him a liberal, Dad wouldn't like that. Stacking cans of powdered milk, Joe pictured himself receiving a scholarship. Perhaps it was time he registered to vote. The wise man knows not to mess with Tamani. Tamani. Hall. Tamani. Tamani. Words are hard. England joins... Okay, so join the Einheits back. England is lost. We didn't get England. I don't really care, I'll be honest with you. Because where we're going, the earth will not be enough. We're going to a sea that's not on the earth. I will promise you that. Let's, we'll do the best we can. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I, mean, I could slower, slower, lower construction spending, but I think we're doing okay for now. So, still, I mean, having a deficit of 5.77 billion, when has this actually happened in American politics besides when Andrew Jackson was president? I don't think it's ever happened like that. Well, actually, I think Bill Clinton had like a little deficit. But, I mean, the debt. We, had, we didn't have any debt under Andrew Jackson. That's right. No debt under Andrew Jackson. So, keep the majority by, by any means. While committed, the party center is the only one of three factions bounded together by a shaky coalition. Our moderate inclinations towards reform does not endear us to both left and right, to say nothing of the Republican Democrats who hold a dim view on any reform at all. This position is terrible for passing bills favorable to any president's agenda, after all. Our supposed allies can and will abandon us should they deem it convenient. For President Kennedy, this situation or solution is obvious. Compromise. The party center must actively take steps to reach every corner of this, every aisle and come to an understanding with as many senators and congressmen as possible. Genuine dialogue with party leaders will help convince doubters of our well-meaning intentions, making them more willing to vote alongside us in Congress. Acquiring the majority necessary to enact reform is a prerequisite to success for the next four years, and nobody accusations of selling out from this base will convince the president otherwise. We get cat herder, huh? So be it, yeah. Under Bill Clinton and Congress, they had a deficit. But we still had debt. Which we still have debt. Hmm. Maybe by the end of this campaign, we will have no debt. I can't promise you that, though. I really can't promise you that. Let's get some pop-up attacks. Because I love the helicopters. I love me some shoppers. The Law of Equivalent Exchange. James Eastland, George Wallace, Margaret Smith, Strom Thurmond, each... Names that had come to haunt Kennedy during his short presidency, each of them had an axe to grind. Eastland was a staunch segregationist. Wallace resented him for getting the party's nomination. Smith was intent on continuing her long-dead husband's conservative legacy, and Thurman, still bitter from losing in 60, was determined to keep his stranglehold over the party's right-wing faction. All in all, a motley collection of villains and renegades, but an unnecessary one. Without the reactionary bigwigs in the party, President Kennedy knew he had little hope of wrangling Congress or getting his legislation through. It often seems strange that he had to draft a civil rights bill alongside people who were so staunchly against the cause of justice, but American politics has been the same since the war. In his quiet moments, he often found himself wondering what Jack would have done, what his father would have done. Would they have worked with people like this to try and better America? Was it worth whatever price he'd end up having to pay? Putting on his brave face, President Kennedy held individual meetings with each of the reactionary strong men and women to hear their thoughts on the bill. Carefully, careful to not make any promises or acquiesce to any of their demands, pardon, suggestions. Uh, the president assured them that he valued the party's unity above all and that he would not go ahead with the civil rights legislation without the full support of the party. Privately, he knew it would cost him. But what? What compromises would have to be made to bring equality to every American. And after all, had been, had been said and done, would it be worth it in the end? The past increases, the future recedes. Possibilities are decreasing, regrets mounting. Oh, crap. Oh, there goes the first cost of uh, political power. Oh, my goodness. That is quite a bit. It's 65. Can't do that. Can't do that. Looking pretty good. We can do this one, though. Extreme environment training. Nice. Make our spec ops even more spec ops. Dealing with... Ooh. Ooh, I don't know. So... There was another comment from yesterday saying that we need to save political power for to ease Southern fears' decisions, especially about civil rights. Increase our standing with the far right a little bit more. Get him voting for, vote for him. Oh, we might not agree on much. It is our duty that the party must ensure that it does not crumble. We must keep the right and center at all costs. However, that does not mean we should not take advantages of the situation if the opportunity arises. Fill the coffers. This will increase our standing with the far right by a lot. We can get a bundle of senators from our next legislation. Supporting the uh, let's see, refusing to endorse a primary challenge and campaigning in the state. We can show a few senators that we care enough about them to get their vote. Oh my goodness, I'm not really sure. I want to do this one though. Planning the civil rights bill. Well, we'll see what happens. I don't know. I guess maybe that's not good. Already use your connections. Well, we'll see what happens. Maybe that was a bad idea. I'm not gonna spend any more political power though, and we are like continually spending more money every, <laughs> all the time, just to get more civilian support. So. And I guess it's probably better to do that now than later when I can't get any more civil rights support, so. We'll see. 
Because right now, actually, Russia's on fire. But that's 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 pretty normal. That's pretty gosh darn normal. So the Senate controls it. Of course, 55. Uh, that, oh, I wonder. If we try to do civil rights, sideline the Dixiecrats, we'll strengthen the Civil Rights Act and get a few votes at the risk of angering the far right. Ooh. Pakistan becomes independent. Cool. I don't know, man. The far right will not want us there at all. Uh, but we'll do rally the progressives. They may be few, but men and women of good principle still remain within the white gold edifices of Washington, D.C. Though these advocates of change come from many backgrounds and classes and caucus for different parties, but I believe that the U.S. is in dire need of political, social, and economic reform. For the progressive moment, no other or movement, no other option guarantees America's survival for both the near and far future. Currently, America's progressives rally under two factions: President Kennedy's own party center and Senator LBJ's Republicans. Both extremes of the MPP will raise objections over cooperating with the RDS, and Senator Johnson is infamous for both his temperament and his peculiarities. Nevertheless, bipartisanship accords. Uh, legitimacy to legislation in the eyes of the American people. A show of unity be with our natural allies across the aisle can smooth the passage of progressive policies for less backlash and compromise. Well, at least we get some political power from that, which is nice. I am tempted to maybe just do like stuff with Japan first before really trying to enact civil rights stuff. Because as much as I'd love to, uh, we can't. Uh, I can't even think of what I'm saying anymore. Well, we can't do stuff, but I'll be right back real quick. All right, my friends, sorry about that, but President Kennedy felt increasingly confident every time he faced a press in the White House briefing room. He never felt comfortable public speaking, but he felt as he was getting better at addressing the nation. Even so, he'd never have Jack's skills. That man could talk his way out of a pair of handcuffs. Momentarily sad, and he banished all thought of his brother from his mind as the TV cameras blinked on. It wouldn't be good luck for him to tear up in front of America. My fellow Americans, today I speak to you not just as your president, but also as your leader, the helmsman of the great ship we call the U.S. I come to you with a single word, unity. When our founding fathers, founding fathers carved this great nation out of the wilderness, their greatest strength was an unassailable entry. Our unity, a spirit of togetherness and brotherhood which could carry them through any trial no matter how grim. He took a deep breath. Time for the payload. There would be plenty of his supporters out there in TV land who wouldn't like this, but they'd have to rip the bandit off sooner or later. It's no secret that the National Progressive Party has its history of ideological infighting. It is a curse that affects every group of people eventually. But we can choose how we respond to it. I hereby say before God and America that in my administration I will not let the Pro National Progressive Party be divided by petty factionalism. I refuse to allow party discord to stand in the way of good policy, including civil rights. I intend to work with party stalwarts, including Senator Thurmond and Governor Walls, or major legislation, working with a party for the benefit of the nation. A united party means a united government, and a united government means a united America. Together, we can do great things. President Kennedy felt proud of himself as he stepped from the podium. Unity, a message just about anyone could believe in. At least, he hoped the voters saw that way. The only thing that will redeem mankind is cooperation. And the support will actually increase in the South. It's kind of cool. Oh, good. And we did spend some political power recently, so we can't really do much about that. In the debt. Ooh, the Siberian Black League. Oh, bye bye. Yoro Military District. Huh. And rally the progressives. And now in memoriam. The assassination of JFK was not just another shock to the American politics, it was also a great personal tragedy to his brother Robert. The younger Kennedy had struggled with his grief for a long time and has often even blamed himself for his elder brother's demise. Now that he is in power, he said that the best thing he can do is to honor John's legacy by embodying everything that he stood for, dignity, equality, and emboldening the spirit of America. In which we do get 3% more stability. Not much, but 3% more is still really nice. And it looks like Samara is doing a very good job. Led by Vlasov. He's a despot. Huh. Oh. German military training, low civilian morale, a few officers yet. Oh, hold on. The commies aren't done yet. Our founding mem member slipped the leash. What's they got around here? Uh, the factory, average military morale, white army training, arsenals, mechanical plants, and a severe black market trading, and winter warriors. That's kind of cool. Oh, they made a little circle right there. Nice. Yuga, Yugra, Yugra, Volkuta. Huh. That's cool. Led by Blochkin. Oh, good. This production stuff is done. Great, great, great. It's 65. Let's get some more civilian construction speed as well as infrastructure construction speed. That'd be very good. We can only get 0.81 a day. We got some silhouette detection stuff. Cool. 65. I get some flame thrower threes. Why not? More soft attack. It's not great, but you know what? What else are we going to research? It is only June, even though we started this episode like in February, I think. So, obviously, like every campaign in TNO, it takes a while to get anywhere. It really does. We got. We really have to deal with the Japanese. Who are they led by? National Socialist Kaya Oki, Oki Nori. Okay. He likes numbers, apparently. The state for the military. Million manpower. Plenty of fuel for now. 
Uh, they don't have a lot of divisions, but then, again, they have a lot more than us. A buttload more. Where are you guys at? You guys are around there. I'm going to put... Uh, I don't want to put that many people. Put the... You guys are right here. Okay. Port of LA. In memoriam. Cool. Alright, so with Charity for All... Oh, we can't do that one. Civil rights has been... Act has been voted on. We could do that. Let's do the fighting tyrants since 1776. With the great nation declared its independence, it was a statement against the tyranny of foreign masters who trampled the rights of the little man. When our noble forebears convinced or conceived and embraced the Monroe Doctrine, it was an assertion of our might, our purpose, and our goal in protecting our whole hemisphere from the old world domination in the 40s, we failed. As the vilest tyranny imaginable descended upon Eurasia, our complacent elitist leaders failed to prepare us for the coming storm and then cowardly tried to stay out of the wars until they arrived at our doorstep. Thousands upon thousands of young Americans made ble men bleeding out in the fields of England for a war that was already lost. Our naval might shattered at Pearl Harbor due to an administration that couldn't see the warnings. Our garrisons and marines murdered, captured, and brutalized in the squalid conditions by the Japanese. The foul conspiracy of the Japanese and Germans to drop their doomsday uh, weapon on Oahu. America has suffered terribly, but our suffering is but a fraction of that of the untold millions laboring under fascist tyranny. Europe may be still beyond salvation, but in Asia we may up, perhaps still have the great chance to strike back like avenging angels. Let us explore ways to break the iron grip of the despotic Japanese sphere. Yes, please. Uh, let's see. In memoriam, JFK was a major politician and the leader of the Democratic Party's fledgling social progressive circles. Throughout his life and career, he earnestly advocated for those forward-looking ideas during his time in Congress. A champion of the growing civil rights movement in the U.S., he rallied young voters to the cause of the political equality as well as the need for government that actively provides for welfare of its citizens. Shortly after Nixon's resignation, he ascended to the presidency but was shot weeks later. His brother, RFK, has now ascended to the presidency and plans to continue his father's legacy where he left off. In his various appearances before the public, he has made it clear that he will govern with the same ideals and principles espoused by his brother. The circle for the civil rights and the fate of segregation, a topic about which JFK was especially vocal, defines a large part of his campaign. Robert Kennedy has heralded the proposed Civil Rights Act as one of the cornerstones of his campaign, vowing to pass a bill during his term. Also important is Kennedy's economic policy, also largely inspired by his father. Under his leadership, he claims the federal government will actively work to combat poverty through welfare programs, state grants, and other initiatives. It seems his brother's socially regressive agenda will ring true in all of his actions as president. Bless him. Cool. Seems kind of annoyed in that picture. Uh, let's see. Someone recommended that I go for a civil rights tree in the sec. Go for the second half of the civil rights tree in the elections of '68, or, or even '72. Like, we could get through all of this and do this part later, maybe. So, we'll see what happens. Definitely see what happens. But we have so many events: the coal mine in Beckley, West Virginia, to a little past midday or a little past noon. Stan McCooley bit into a sandwich. Egg salad again. Could his wife make something different for a change? God dang it, he busted his booty down in the mine all god darn day so he could, she could sit on the couch and get fat and watching soaps. And egg salad in his lunchbox every day was the best she could do, chewing his lunch without relish. Stan looked around at others. Crud. Ted's wife packed him roast chicken. Still, it's not like he could afford much better, not after the pay cuts. He'd bet the receptionist at the office companies, or the company offices got paid better than him and risk injury or death every day. Conditions may be better than they used to be, but they could be a hell of a lot better. Not that the president was helping the situation any. The grinning bastard had got into the White House by lying through his teeth, saying he'd support the unions and make conditions better for the working man, of course. Just like every other Washington snake, he'd gone back on it. The second he could, just like every politician did. Stan had voted for him out of the vague hope that Kennedy would do the right thing, but it was not surprised when he'd been stabbed in the back. Kennedy smirked privately as he, uh, stands, I mean, huh. <laughs> Stan's marked privately as he forced down the repulsive egg salad. Kennedy had made an enemy of the unions, and that was not a good enemy to have. If the president thought he could get away with saying one thing and doing another, he had another thing coming. All he had to do was honor his work and give the working man a fair shake, but he chosen to antagonize his strongest supporters instead to satisfy the fickle interests of capital. Stan knew he was a little man, but even the little man has power in a group or a mob. The mob rushes in where individuals fear to tread. Cool. Well, not good for Stan. That's, he's doing the best he can. But hey, the GDP. And actually, you know, we're getting more industrial expertise, which is nice. As well as army professionalism. Cool. Lockheed AC 130E. Ooh. We prefer independence with poverty to servitude with plenty. Ooh. Uh oh. The Indonesian War. Yes. More war. Oh, and now we. Oh, uh, we couldn't complete that. We'll oh, god dang it. That's fine, though. We're going to be the burning jungle. Indonesia is a flame, and what is the situation? Who cares? We've got things to do. Indonesia. Oh, we can only see one more. Oh, come on. Uh, all we need is one division to help out, really, to be honest with you. All right, very good. Send some volunteers. Lavelle, you're being called again. They will allow it. And actually, how many planes can we send over? Or, yeah, actually, there's just planes. 200. Oh, 240. Nice. Very nice. Where are my planes? We got some over here. 240 fighters, tactical bomb, tactical fighters, I mean. Cass. Where are those planes that we used earlier? 16, 16, 16. These are carrier planes. 
Mm, actually, that one was still carrier plane. Let's get some more carrier planes going. At least we're getting into war again. I like that. There's 100. Oh, there it is. Oh, you're still in South Africa. Uh, go up to 100. Even though we probably can't afford that. Both of you come here. And that'll be 200 some. And then we'll need like 40 more. So, let's see. What do we have? Jets, improved spy planes, jet fighters, interceptors, tactical bombers. Uh, there you go. Use some of these guys too. Cool. Come on. There you go. Now we're going to do some damage. I love getting involved in other people's affairs. Oh, so American to me. Ah, the burning jungle. Indonesia aflame. Our analysis predictions regarding the East Indies have proven frightfully accurate. Sukarno's attempt at using martial law to solve the crisis with the PKI has been a dismal failure. After years of frustration with his despotic administration, Liberal Democrat Mohamed Atta has risen up against Sukarno under the banner of free Indonesia. While Sukarno may stress that everything is under control, Atta is moving swiftly to seize the countries, having already taken large swaths of A Ake, Borneo, and Papua. This could be a critical opportunity for the U.S. to gain a new ally against the Japanese domination of Asia as long as we act quickly. Oh, we will. And there's another comment from yesterday's video saying that we should do pick up the red phone, but do nothing more um, so that uh, we can focus on other stuff, maybe. So, given that both of us are nuclear powers, it stands to reason that we must tread carefully when interfering with the co-prosperity sphere. While Japan seems to be controlled by a level-headed man, we must still be careful to toe the final, fine line between isolationism and being mavericks. We will place a call to the Japanese on the red telephone. We will assure them that we have no interest in sending Japanese boys home with American bullets in them, yet our commitment to a democratic movement around the world brings us a moral obligation to support those who we fight for freedom in Indonesia. Reminding them of Indonesia's technical independence and sovereignty, we will cause, caution them against launching an intervention into the East Indies and reminding them that threatening the freedom of a southern people may have dire consequences. By taking this focus, America will begin its involvement in Indonesia and will face consequences depending on how this conflict will end. And to get a little more unified. And then I can send another division as well. Which is fine. We might not even need it. But we probably will. Looks like we've got plenty of APCs finally. And Samara unifies with Russia. Good job. Anarchy is winding down. We got some scout helicopters, which I, should, which I should probably stop making. Cass is looking slightly okay. Hueys are looking great, which is awesome. Yeah, liquid reserves, thank you. And where are we? So we, got, we need more of that. APCs are looking pretty gosh darn good right now. Let's go down to three then. Or two, I guess. It's two. Help that out. It's cool. Hey, we've shown up. Wheeler, you're back at it again. Here we go, boys. <sighs> Great. I love it. Ah, oh, give me that speed. Speed like no other. Look at that. That's so good. Uh, you know what? Since we're doing stuff, just move around a whole bunch. It hurts our you know, attrition stuff or whatever. I don't really care. Get back down there if you can. I want to see what they're going to do. Where are they going? They're coming down here. Civilian budget boost. No, 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 no. We need more. Just keep spending. There's no good way. Can we beat you guys up? Just beat them up for funsies. Nice. And then come back over here. Uh, can I do any of this stuff? Yes. I still can, maybe? Actually, what is... What are these? Ready the Australians. Uh, mandatory naval treatment. Eh, that's okay. Beginning the blockade. This will raise a National Progressive Party support for the war. Uh, we get 100 political power. Actually, that's not too bad. That's really not too bad, actually. Uh, the Air Force, that's okay. I like the Air Force on alert, which might end after we're done here. We will lower support for the war. Raise National Progressive support for the war. Hmm. Maximum pressure. I'll be honest, as much as I want to do this, and I want that political power, though, and domestic support for the war, freedom fighters... Everything must go. Ship over industry. Ship over industry, yeah. Lower domestic support. End of the line. Eh, I, I don't really care, I'll be honest. We'll do fine enough without them, so. Extreme environment training. I, that's perfect. That's perfect for the conditions in we're right now. Ooh, what is this? Special forces? Urban? Ooh, look at that. More training in urban warfare will make our soldiers more effective in the brutal door-to-door -door combat that occurs in the urban environment. Yes, please. Uh, Frontline, more advisors, dom lower domestic support. No, we do not want to do that. We want as much domestic support right now as possible. No, nah, we're good. Let's see. Rally domestic support. Republican and Democrat support for the war is middling. It might be easy to escalate the fight in Indonesia, but the longer and harder we fight, the more public they'll find itself disillusioned with the war. We have little right to be fighting in. Uh, support for the war is high. Uh, I don't really care, I'll be honest. Uh, international operations, nothing here, nothing here. 
Whatever, whatever. I don't care. Just save political power. Actually, can you kill these guys off? Conversations from the street. Indonesia calls. The San Diego Convention Center was a, was a host to a large, raucous MPP rally following the recent onset of hostilities in Indonesia. Much like the rest of California, America's finest cities simmered with anti-Japanese sentiment. Now that an opportunity to strike back at their sworn enemies has appeared, the simmer turned into a violent geyser sweeping San Diego's citizenry in equal parts rage and euphoria. Let's get those slimy effing... A bastardinos while they're down, shouted Jeffrey Calloway amidst a rabble-rousing crowd. The college student carried with him an old propaganda poster from World War II, held high above his head. Made indistinct from the foremost of upraised arms around him, but he seemed little to care. Bomb them, bomb them all, went the mantra he and his rally breathed out as one before the unleashed pent-up energy onto downtown San Diego later that night. The mood in MRCS, or, uh, Marine Corps or something something uh, San Diego, was contrastingly subdued. Grunts grumble as grumbles as grunts aren't, are won't of course, but many also wore ribbons and pins from South Africa, Desi Glory, Gory, South Africa. Needless to say, a good number of Harvard, a good number harbored a little appetite for another adventure so soon after the last. Lance Corporal Timothy Crossbow. That's a cool last name. Carried his opinions louder and more bluntly than his colleagues. We've already stuck our dicks into the veld, said the Marines, and look how swell that went for us. A couple ten thousand of our boys and sent back home on a flag in the Corps, in the Corps thoughts and prayers. Now they're sending us to some malaria-infested jungle in the middle of nowhere. Better, better pay, be better at least. Pay better at least. Uh, like its infamous volcanoes, Indonesia has erupted into the worst fighting the peninsula has ever seen since the Second World War. The free world clamors for an intervention into the rising sun's soft underbelly to loosen the empire's hold over the East Indies oppressed, but South Africa remains fresh in the minds of many. Does America have the will to simic one war after another? They ask. We will always stand up to tyranny. How many more will be sent to die? We'll always stand up to tyranny. However, I, I kind of wish it was... I know that these are already kind of pre-made events. I kind of wish it was a little bit more enthusiasm, because, yeah, I know people died in the war in Africa. But honestly, there probably wasn't that many, like maybe a few thousand max. And I get it, you know, we shouldn't be sending guys over there, but we won the war. We literally came back victorious. And yes, it was costly, but there should be at least a little bit more, I don't know, I won't say Thanksgiving, but like, will, like, hey, we actually won here. Yes, it was tough. Yes, it was difficult. But we actually won against the Nazis. Like, <laughs> I kind of wish it was a little bit more sentiment like that. Like, at least have the other side, you know, like, yes, it would cost us a lot, but... We still did great, so... I don't know, that's just my thoughts. Actually, you know what, screw these guys, I'm, I'm coming down here. I'm just going to circle these divisions first. There you go. All you need is just a bunch of close air support and a division. <laughs> just one division, that's all. Cool. Now I should take them out right here. This is, this is their last little thing here. Oh, please take them out, we can't take them out yet. Got it. Uh, let's see, I doubt we can get over here in time. Can we get down here? That'd be cool if we could. We can try it. I kind of doubt. Oh, they they shifted the directions. Oh, oh, cutting it. Hungry sets with. Ooh. Can we actually get in there first? Oh, oh, nice. Oh, we got these two divisions still encircled. That's good. Give us a little more organization first. That'd be nice. Uh, cool. Military authority. I don't even care. I really don't even care. I know I'm weird. Point zero nine a day, huh? All right, kill these guys off. You have more than enough skill to do so. How are we already, like, 40, over 45 minutes in this video? Oh my goodness. Time goes by too quickly. It really does when I play TNO. I like it too much. Cool, good job, guys. Good job. Uh, come down here. Wow, you have already been flooding down here. Yeah, come down here if you can. Stay right there. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to redo this. Boom. Like that. Fighting tyranny since 1776. Great. And with Mouse Swords, none. We gotta do that. But we'll see. Brothers in arms. Investing in allies. Domestic preparedness. Hey, I'll do that one too. So the National Progressive Party, well, when they were elected, the people, American people spoke up with one thunderous voice, tearing down the entrenched elite and embracing a righteous campaign against a Japanese menace, wherever it is to be found. At least that's what the party's National Committee chairman claimed at the last convention. In reality, our victory was a lot more narrow than we'd like, and many of our voters supported us for our progressive domestic agenda rather than the campaign of vengeance many of the party leadership still would like to see as the core of our platform. In addition, many other former Dixiecrats in the party are openly sympathetic to the isolationist stances and now only pay lip service to containing Japan. Now we, we now have a difficult choice ahead. Properly re reinstating the draft and enact war preparation measures to ensure our nation is protected against the many foreign threats and ready to act swiftly like the pouncing eagle or to try to gradually build support for these things through a fierce media campaign while optimizing our industry for wartime production. The latter is popular, but slow and may leave us unready for a major conflict, the former the opposite. Kill them off here. The Fighting Tyranny Since 1776, Washington. 
No matter your political leanings, all recent conversations in the capital invariably turn to the same subject. President RFK's announcement that the U.S. would seek to revise the post-war modus vivendi with the Empire of Japan. A policy pronouncement, though vague, has been a central policy plank of the National Progressive Party since its formation, although the administration has remained tight-lipped on concrete initiatives. This has only encouraged the imagination of the political class in Washington. Members of the MPP congressional de delegation could be heard throughout the week speculating on America's newfound political foreign policy, ranging from doubling military and financial aid to the Organization of Free Nations, to actively destabilizing the co-prosperity spheres via its many recess restive insurgencies. While stressing that the ultimate decision rests with the president, senior MPP figures emphasize that all options remain on the table. Members of the Republican Democratic Party have expressed skepticism towards the president's confrontational foreign policy, viewing the endeavor as a naive adventurism. A senior RD uh, policy aide who will ask not to be named Pan the NPP policy is dangerously reckless with little consideration for de-escalation. It's all fun and games, they remarked, until the nukes fly. At least the NPP fights for America. Cool. Every one gap, more fun, force the attack. Push them out. And we still get more air XP, which is awesome. And we've cut these guys off, which is great. You wanna help out there? That's fine with me. All that matters is we kill all these soldiers. So they have lots to fight with. But, Bucket Tang. Oh, cool, yeah, there you go. If you can get in there, that'd be great. Hey, they died anyways. Nice job, guys. Nice job, really. Good job. Oh, uh, we're going to race down here to rescue that division if we can. Cool. Oh, there you are. Hello. You're not going to move. Rescue it. Rescue the free Indonesians. No, 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 no. Get back here. They are cut... Oh, actually, they're not cut off because they got all these... Oh, they are cut off. Okay, cool. Wow, we're all the way over here. Get over there. Go, 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 go. Oh, they showed up, and they're dead. Go there, and go through there. Beautiful. Awesome. Political landscape. Dealing with the NP... Uh, oh, wait. Build the coffers? We've already used connections for support. Uh, the front lines? Oh, yeah. I don't really care about that, to be honest. <laughs> Where's my division? Oh, there you are. You just come down here and just kill them this way. <laughs> there you go. Ah, Saturday mornings with Tom and Jerry. In one surprise release, Metro Goldwyn Meyer announced to millions ooh, uh, of eager American children that their most famous cat and mouse duos come to CBS. A press release from the broadcasting channel itself said that the new episodes of the award winning cartoon show, Tom and Jerry, will feature its weekend morning lineup along with reruns of the shorts made by Gene Deitch and original creators Hannah Barbara. Uh, the series has undergone numerous changes in both art style and content since their introduction to the viewing public in 1940, but MGM has promised to maintain the consistently high quality of comedy that it is known for. With the venerable Chuck Jones of Warner Brothers cartoon's fame in charge of the reboot, observers believe the big five studios have every reason to be confident in their claims. Regardless of the details, fans of both young and old have since expressed their ecstasy in seeing the duo's slapstick escapades every Saturday morning with bags of heartfelt mail delivered to MGM's post office box. And the future seems bright for a centerpiece of an entire generation's childhoods, and it may just remain such for another for as long as it continues to run. Perfection debuts on the little screen. God, I love Tom and Jerry. I love it. All right, uh, we can get that, but we are going to get smacked down here pretty harshly, and they're going to probably be so lucky with that. Can you actually push it? Ooh, no, not quite. Oh, just hold for now then. Hold and plan, and don't worry about it. Domestic preparedness, great. Fire up the people. Well, I'll not do that. Feed the beast. Eh, let's do that one next, because we can. Eh, no, we're not going to do that. Let's do some civil rights stuff. With malice towards none. Our nation has always been a melting pot for a multitude of peoples of all colors and creeds, and yet the idea of America as a nation for whites alone persists. It was a people's desire to put an end to this tired, old sentiment that swept RFK into power. If we're to move forward as one country, we must remove the legal obstacles to the full integration of all races and a guarantee that all might be afforded the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We are likely to face stiff opposition from the Southern Conservatives and even from within the far right ranks of our own party, but we must push on in the name of a fair and more equal America. How is support doing for now? Still doing okay, I guess. Domestic preparedness. The devil of the policy formulation was in details. As the cabinet drafted the outline of America's industrial strategy to support any future war with Japan, two distinct schools of thought has emerged. One championed by Secretary of Defense, advocates for the expansion of military infrastructure and production capability. The legacy of President Joseph Kennedy's failure to build up America's military continues to haunt the pre Pentagon. Proponents of this plan argue that the buildup of military equipment needed to support a future war that must start today, even at the expense of other industrial or economic priorities. They warn that ultimately America will go to war with the military it has, or rather than the military it wants. The Secretary of Commerce takes a different tack, arguing that fostering the growth of America's civilian industrial base would yield accelerating dividends in the long run. The also diversion of American industry into military production, they argue, would be monstrously ineffect inefficient and create a hyper-militarized economy like that of Germany or Japan, a nation of free men enslaved to the guns. Even if it would take time to shift civilian factories to military production in the crisis, America remains protected by the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, buying time to bring American industry to bear. 
military have its material. We we'll drown out our enemies in raw industrial might. That's the way we're gonna go, boys and girls. Or whoever's watching, really. Cool. And let's go up here. I know this video's gone on very long, but that's pretty much every video in any TNO uh, episode. And a little bit of lag. I wonder what happened. Cool. As long as they can't get too many supplies, we'll be good doing this. And we only have one division doing this the entire time. All right, they have a little bit more uh, stuff there. Oh, Afghanistan and Pakistan go to war with each other. Take that last victory point. What happens down here doesn't matter. Oh, wait. They cut me off. Oh, they're so slow. I, I went... I went... What the... We went so fast. We literally passed by them. And then they attacked us. That is a little insane. How fast we're going. God, I love helicopters. Come on, there's only four divisions here. I'm only attacking with one division. <laughs> oh, man. Takaki, elected Prime Minister of Japan. Okay. What does the army think? We're so fast, we literally fly by them. And then they are forced to attack us. That is so nice. Look at take Jakarta. Because this is going... Look how, look how great it is. It's so much blue. I love blue. That's my favorite color. Uh, just going to start taking all these provinces then. There you go. And we won the war. No, it's so easy when you have a bunch of a massive air force as well as support helicopters But I think that's going to end today's episode my friends if you enjoyed it consider leaving a like subscribe if you're new Check out my discord link in the description below and I'll see you tomorrow when we will try to pass some civil rights uh, Legislation Thank you very much for watching and have a great 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 rest of your day